Praise the Lord, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Today's scripture reading comes to us from 3 John 3, 3 John, and taken from the first uh, 1 to 4. I'm going to read 1 to 2, and then our congregation will go, we all will read through. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that it is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater charm than to hear that my children walk in the truth. May God bless you. Amen. We will sing our theme song, Holy Ground. Remedies, preventive medicine, and all those lifestyle stuff. 
And he said, why are you applying for an R1 visa? An R1 visa is a religious missionary volunteer visa. You're a doctor, you're going to work as a doctor, and you're applying for an R1 visa. Isn't an R1 visa for a pastor or an elder or a deacon or something that has anything to do with the church activity? And I was trying my best to explain to him that, you know, um, to us Adventists, we believe that our bodies are the temple of God and that what we do to our bodies um, will result in either going to heaven or going to hell. And he was scratching his head and I, I couldn't explain to him. He couldn't see uh, why being a medical missionary would be a religious thing. But as, we, as I, I grew and learned, it truly is a religious thing. Being, helping, uh, helping some, somebody to, to learn to take care of his body is, is a spiritual thing. So, <clears throat> I'm sharing to you uh, a message that uh, I, uh, is, is very close to my heart. I've heard several doctors talking about uh, the Bible and health. And uh, I am trying to make a um, sort of a summary of the lots of them that I have heard. And they resonate, they resonate in my heart really, really strongly because um, as I go on in my Christian experience and I try and take care of my body, it's becoming a spiritual thing. It's very important for me to, to be able to show, to, uh, to give myself to God a holy and acceptable sacrifice. God didn't leave us alone to, to figure out how we should be healthy. No, he is, he is not at ease. He does not just, he didn't just create us, but he gave us instructions so that we can take care of our bodies. But before I share, let us bow our heads so that we can ask him to be amongst us. Father, we are so grateful that you are always there to help us. You know just what to do to help us keep our bodies prosperous, both in spirit and in truth. You know how to teach us to understand your word. Your word is so important, so valuable, so life-changing and empowering. It is a light to our paths. I pray that you may help us to be inspired as we study your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the Bible says on anything that has to do with health <clears throat> is one of, in many ways, that can prove that the Bible is inspired. Um, do you believe that what the Bible tells us about health will prove that the Bible is an inspired book? We are, as Adventists, we, we know that there's Deuteronomy and Leviticus, and these Deuteronomy and Leviticus are uh, books in the Bible that have all those laws and uh, statutes. Anyway, the first part of Deuteronomy 6, it begins with calling to careful and complete obedience to the commands of God. In verses 1 to 9, let me read with you Deuteronomy 6, 1 to 9. Now these are the commandments. If you want to know what commandments they are, you can open your Bible and read Deuteronomy 1, uh, Deuteronomy and Leviticus. That's too long and we can talk about that in this, in this time. But anyway, it's saying here, these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. Right? So Moses was given instructions by God to tell the Israelites that there are things that you have to follow as you go into the land that I'm going to give to you. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his commandments to keep all his statutes and his commandments. It didn't say some, it didn't say most, it said all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, and he said, which I requested you, which I ask maybe humbly. No, he didn't say, I command you to obey, to keep the laws, all the statutes and the commandments, thy son and thy son's son and all the days of thy life and that thy days may be prolonged. So have you ever seen a sickly, sickly person who lives to 112 or 110 or 
or maybe even 91, 92, 93. I believe our brother here is 91 years old, is relatively healthy. He would not reach a prolonged amount of years without being relatively fit or relatively healthy. Praise the Lord for you, brother, an experience that can show us. Here, therefore, the Lord continues, O Israel, <clears throat> and observe to do it. You have to watch out to do it, that ye, it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily. So that it's not, you will become, you will become well for a long time, you will increase also mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, because he promised that he would take care of Israel. And these words, he said, as you go down further, which I command you this day shall be in thine heart. Sometimes we can memorize these things. We, we write them down. They're in my computer. They're in your iPad or in your USB flash drive. But it says here you don't put it there. Where is it supposed to be? In thine heart. These words I command thee shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And thou shalt talk to them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and thou shalt, uh, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. So everything that the Lord has told us to do, commanded statutes and commandments, is supposed to be everywhere. We teach it to everybody that we come in contact with. It's practically everything that we live and breathe. And then we go down further in Deuteronomy 6 verse 20, and it says, And when thy son asketh thee in, that, in time to come, saying, What mean these testimonies? And the statutes and the judgment which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Your son might ask, Father, Mom, my son sometimes does that. He comes to me and says, Why don't we do this? Why can't we eat this? He loves ice cream. He loves um, eating junk food. Why don't we eat this? Why can't I stay late? Why this and that? Then as you go downward in verse 24 in Deuteronomy 6, it says, and you are going to answer your son or your daughter, and the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our own good always. Okay? So that you will prosper, that you may preserve us alive as it is this day. So what does this say here? Why do we have to think about these things all the time? Why do we have to teach these things all the time? For our good, always. Not sometimes, as we choose, but always. In Proverbs 4, 20 to 22, in the English Standard Version, it says, My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those that find them, life to those that find them, and healing to all their flesh. So if you're sick, or if you want to keep healthy, it means you're supposed to be attentive to the words of God and incline your ear to his sayings and let them not escape from your sight. Everywhere you look, everything you say, everything you live and breathe, that's what it is. What advantages did the Jew have over the Gentiles at that time, in Old Testament times? I, you know already that the Jews had all the laws and the statutes, yeah? They had the laws and the statutes that showed them the way to live a life that's prosperous. And prospered they did, right? They, the, the, the Jews prospered. In Deuteronomy 7 again, 12 to 15 from the English Standard Version. And because you listen to these rules and keep them and do them, the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love that He shown to your fathers. He will love you. He will bless you mightily. Multiply you. 
He will also bless the fruit of your womb. Now, being a gynecologist obstetrician, this is one of the verses I tell my patients when they come, I have some specialty in infertility. And I said, okay, look at this. This is a Bible promise. If you do you, the Lord's laws and statutes, it says here, He will bless the fruit of your womb. So maybe the reason why you're infertile is because <clears throat> you may not be in some way that you know or you don't, not following the laws and the statutes. What's really uh, very interesting for me here is, it goes, as it goes down here, it says, it will even bless the, there will be no male or female barren among you or even among your livestock. So they were, uh, they had a lot of livestock and even their livestock would, would not be barren. In other words, they would become ranchers, rich ranchers in the future if they would follow the laws and the statutes. And then you ask now, what advantage do Bible believing Christians have over non-Bible believing people? Simple. Again, like the Jews. We have the word and the prophets to follow. We have the word and the prophets to enjoy. And then we have the word <clears throat> and the prophets to share. Okay? We grow as we share. We shall go through things and some uh, uh, topics in the Bible and hopefully we will be able to, to understand these things, digest them and remember and be able to share. A father was once asked by a son, why am we, why do you tell me not to do this? Why do you tell me not to eat this? Why can't I go out with my friends? He was teenage, mid-teenage, the time it is really hard to control children. And it, it, they start to think on their own and they say, why, Father, can I, can I go out with them? Why can't I have this? Why can't I eat that? Anyway, the father, a father said, um, he said to his son, well, do you remember? They were having, they were homeschooled children. Uh, this was a homeschooled boy. And the father had just gone through Cambodia. You remember that Cambodia, they have a lot of landmines there? Uh, they, during uh, the time when there was this communist invasion, they had put a lot of landmines around the place. And uh, let's say there are two parents there in Cambodia. One parent says, oh son, I love you so much. You can do anything you want to do. I, I don't want to be restricting you. You can walk anywhere you want to do, anywhere you please, anytime you want to go, you can go. And so this son goes out and goes everywhere, anywhere his heart calls him to go. And unfortunately, he steps on a landmine and he's maimed for life. Or maybe he even dies. That's one family. On the other hand, you have another set of parents which would call, when the son asked them, they would say, come here, let's sit down and talk. And the father opens up a, a map of Cambodia and he, show, uh, he shows him all those really small paths where people can walk, okay? And the, the, the son says, why do I have to walk in these little restrictive paths? I want to go everywhere. I want to experience Cambodia to its fullest. The father says, this restrictive paths have been swept of minds. We love you so much that we don't want you to be maimed by the man minds. We love you so much we want you to live long in this world and we don't want you to walk beyond this restrictive paths. Is it really restrictive? Is it really restrictive? No. The restrictions are only there for our good always. So it was for the son, restrictive, but for his good. In the winter of 1885, in the district of Lower Austria, two sweethearts, 40-year-old divorced, twice married, Alois Sheko Gruber, and 17-year-old Garako, so applied for a marriage license from a parish priest. They were, uh, they were going to the priest. There was a problem with their application. You see, they were second cousins. And the Bible forbids marriage between close relatives, right? The Bible says you can't marry a close relative. Yet, they wanted to get married. There were some other problems, too. The, the Bible also forbade that marriage be to, uh, this marriage because 
the marriage of the, of the husband was not because of, there was, it, the divorce was not from biblical grounds for divorce. And it was also a bad idea, their age it was so big, different, the disparity between their ages. But regardless of God's commands, in, because in this area, it was not restricted to married close cousins, the priest married them anyway. So they got married, and four years later, they delivered a third child. The child's name was Adolf. His name is Adolf Hitler. Hmm. You see, a parish priest's permission to violate God's instruction brought to the world Adolf Hitler. God had given instructions that would have preserved the world from Adolf Hitler, right? He would not have been born. He, God's instructions would have prevented it. So many great disasters in this world have been brought about because instructions in God's word have been ignored. Towards the end of 1918, you remember the swine flu or the Spanish flu, they call it? In, in, during, during the, towards the end of World War I, when the people were starting to rejoice because it's, uh, the, the war had ended, their rejoicing was premature because around this time, the swine flu was peaking. And during the World War I, there were 8 million deaths, around 8 million deaths from the deaths from, from the war. But the, the swine flu, there were deaths of 20 to 50 million people who died from the swine flu. Mm -hmm. And studies have proven, <clears throat> have come to discover that where, uh, they discovered where the swine flu started. It started in China, where people lived with their hogs. Mm -hmm. In the same house, in one house, the swine and the people lived together. And so the swine flu, it jumps from the swine to humans, okay? This, there's this interspecies thing. So swine flu started there in China where people were living with so the swine, with pigs, okay? And if they had only obeyed that the swine is unclean, you don't even go, you don't even touch it. You know, in China, during the older times, uh, pigs were treasured. It was something like something. Uh, the more pigs you had in your house, the the richer you were. The higher people looked up to you as somebody in the in the place. Okay. So uh, unfortunately, that was how they 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 did it, and so that's how this uh, swine flu came about. Yeah. Uh, is it just coincidence? that the Bible says that the swine is unclean and that we're not supposed to be around unclean animals? Mm. No, it's not. The warnings of science today echo the warnings of the Bible about swine. How about the threatening MRSA? You know MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's a very, very, um, when you get infection, infected with MRSA, there's no antibiotics that can help you almost. It's a very, because methicillin is already a strong antibiotic. But, and anyway, MRSA started from eating swine food, uh, swine meat. And then it, uh, whatever swine, the, the virus, or the virus that was in the swine, jumped to people. So if people didn't eat swine, as the Bible says you're not supposed to, you would not get your MRSA, the methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus. Is it restricted not to eat swine meat? God's instructions are for our good, always. For our prosperity, always. The Bible is replete with instructions and information regarding health, and many Christians, however, are oblivious to it. You know, when you talk about you're not supposed to eat this and you're not supposed to eat that, they'll say, really? It's in the Bible? looks like we're the only ones who know it. Many Christians are oblivious. They don't know these things. Many have no idea how much God wants us to be healthy, to be pain-free, and to be living uh, quality lives. Many feel that God doesn't care what they eat, what they do, whatever they have to do and uh, to their bodies. God doesn't care. Many think that. 
One of the very first instructions, however, that God gave when he first talked to Adam and Eve was what they were to eat, right? One of the first instructions, as aside from go down and multiply, he said, you can eat this, 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 and that. He said that. What, uh, what was the food we're supposed to eat? Then, in his next instruction, uh, when we're down in Genesis 1, he, he said, you can't eat this, right? Then, you can eat this, and then later he said, you can't eat this. Those were instructions. Some people think that what we eat doesn't really matter. But you can ask Eve. She fixed Adam something for supper, or maybe for dinner, and tell her whether that thing had, a, had no consequence. It had a consequence. It mattered what Eve had prepared. They were not just <clears throat> arbitrary. The laws that God gave, or the instructions that God gave, were not just arbitrary or common instructions on diet. Had God's instructions been followed, there would not be disasters today. There would be no diseases today. But there was someone who wanted that man not follow these instructions, the tempter. He tempted us, he tempted Adam and Eve to be disobedient, and thus now comes the weight of pain and death. But God still wants men to be healthy, right? God still wants men to be happy. So he gives some more instructions. First to Adam after the fall, then to Noah after the flood, he again gave instructions on diet, but his instructions again were ignored. Okay, you remember even that Noah became a drunk, right? He became a drunk. He didn't follow. And after that, because man didn't follow, ignored God's instructions, rapid misery and death shortens men's lives and Noah sees his children, his grandchildren, and great-grandchildren sick and dying. He lived longer than any of them. Noah did live longer than them. He died actually one to two years before Abraham was born. By the time we, we get to Moses, lifespan had shrunk in from a, almost a thousand years to just about 70, 80 to 120 years. To preserve the life of the Israelites in the wilderness, God controlled their diet and gave details of a healthy lifestyle to Moses. His instructions not only covered diet, actually. So, ah, you're reading that one. It's only, you, you don't know what you're talking about. It's only Leviticus 12, and that's nailed to the cross. But he gave other, diet, other guidelines too for a healthy lifestyle. His instructions not only cover diet, but also cover topics such as cleanliness and public sanitation. God's instructions when followed were so effective that after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, there was not one person in the camp of Israelites feeble among the tribes. Parents were to teach their children and grandchildren everything walking, sitting, laying down, standing up every time for their good always, for their prosperity. When individuals and nations follow God's instructions, you remember that when they would follow, they would be prosperous. When they didn't follow, they would be, they would be captive. So it was a swing of following and not following, following and not following. And it is very interesting because archaeologists have found out that in their digging, that around the time when Israel was their most obedient, when they were most obedient for years and years, they were following the laws and statutes. The archaeologists noted that the people around them, the, the Gentile people around Israel, they, they were not so much in contact with, with unclean animals. That means that once you are prosperous, you will be a light to the people around you. So they'll say, why are you not eating this? Why are you this and that? Do you know the blue zones thing, right? You know the blue zones? There's several, there are zones in the whole world where you have healthy people. 
And one zone is Loma Linda, and it is the Seventh-day Adventists that are in Loma Linda that are the longest lived in the world. One of the many long and many areas, and Loma Linda is one of them. It is a shining light for us, for our own good, so that we can prosper and be a light to the people around us. That they may know upon um, that, that thy way, O God, may be known upon the earth, thy saving help among the nations. Mm -hmm. So we are supposed to be an example. That is just say, be an example for what? No? He gave us instructions how to live so that we can be an example, so that we will be a saving help to all the nations. And that's Psalm 67 too. In just 10 days, on a simple diet of fruit, grains, nuts, and vegetables. Remember Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Right? It is not just by chance. They had followed. They graduated from the University of Babylon, summa cum laude. It's because of their lifestyle. It's because of their following the laws and statutes. In Proverbs 31, 17, it says even, uh, it's not only the food. If you're going to go through all exhaustively, there's so many things, but I just chose a few. There's also, in Proverbs 31, 17, English Standard Version, she dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Proverbs 31, 17. This implies that there is a type of dressing up that can keep you healthy, right? Yes, the Bible even says in 1 Timothy 2.9, in like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. And then you say, oh, that is for uh, modest apparel, that is, um, that is an issue more of, of morality than it is of health. Maybe it is, but you see the Bible is multifaceted. When you look and read and understand, ask the Spirit to speak to you, to speak to you in more ways than you can ever imagine. So it is really telling us here, too, that if you dress modestly, you will have good circulation in your body, you will be healthy, right? Because life is in the blood. And circulation is what brings the blood uh, around the body. So you see the Bible gives us this. In the New Testament, even in the New Testament, we have these things. The sick were brought to Jesus. And he would say, um, don't sin anymore, meaning follow the laws and the statutes. He would say that, and then they would, he would heal them, and they would be healed. However, after Jesus had gone up to heaven, what happened then was the disciples brought on, carried on the work of, of Jesus, and he and many people were again brought to them, in multitudes actually, brought to them. So when people were sick around the time of the disciples, the hospital for the sick was the church. Okay? That's a very profound statement. People were brought to Paul. People were brought to Peter and John, where the brethren were together. So they were not brought to an infirmary. They were brought to the church. The place where people worshipped God and loved to follow and obey his word. As the people of God lived by example, they could teach and help others to follow their example. Following and obeying the word of God and live a prosperous life. In the Garden of Eden, there was no sickness. In heaven, God's abode, there is neither sickness nor pain. No sin, no sickness. Jesus didn't only die for our sins, right? He also died for our illnesses. <clears throat> In Matthew 8, 17, English Standard Version, it says, This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. So God sent his son to take all our illnesses and bear all our diseases. Health is not a matter of chance or luck. It involves proper habits of life. Proper meaning following the laws and the statutes. It involves change in lifestyle. It involves, it encompasses the choices of what we put into our mouths and what we do to our bodies. 
In Proverbs 3, 5 to 8, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. As you go down further, it says, be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. So many texts in the Bible to tell you that if you trust in the Lord, if you obey the Lord's leading, you will have a healthy life. There will be healing for your flesh. There will be refreshments for your bones. In Romans 2, 1 to 2, rather 12, 1 to 2, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. You don't want to give anything ugly, right? To anybody, that would be. Much more to God. You don't want to give your body to God a sickly sacrifice, but rather a living, thriving sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Are we able to do that? Are we able to give God the living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable? I think in my heart we can. Because he didn't, he didn't ask us to do something without giving us instruction to be able to be so, right? God is not illogical. And he says, turn away from evil. It will be <clears throat> to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. They are that the uh, that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I first was introduced into the health message by a friend who was singing the song, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, and he says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. You know, I read this verse several times, so many times. But then when this friend of mine sang it to me, you know, when music sort of passes somewhere in your brain, that it opens up your frontal lobe and you understand what's happening sometimes, most of the time, if you're really of same mind. It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. I was thinking, so God is going to destroy me? So God is not love? Anyway, further down, I saw in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, what? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have, ye have of God, and ye are not your own. You're not your own. That's why God is asking of me to follow the laws and statutes. He will punish me because I'm not my own. I don't belong to myself. I belong to him twice. He created me and he died for me. I'm not my own. For ye, have, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Saying with a loud voice in Revelation 4, 7, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth the sea, and the fountains of waters. And in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, maybe it's not only, ah, the health laws are only for what you eat and what you drink. But it goes even further. Whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. God loves to see his people healthy and happy. That's why in 3 John 2, in uh, 3 John 1 to 4, in our memory verse, read, and the text read this morning, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things. It's like God telling us, My beloved children, I wish above all things that you will prosper and be in health. And you know that when you have a sound mind, it is because you have a sound body, right? A sound body begets a sound mind. I can remember very distinctly. When I had taken this, um, you see, I'm an obstet I was an obstetrician gynecologist, and I thought I knew all about birthing and everything. I, and I came to the United States, and I took the, the midwifery exam. While I took the exam, I was sick. 
I had just been diagnosed with Lyme disease. You know what Lyme is? You get bit by a tick, and it, it wreaks havoc over your entire body. And I was sick to the bone, and yet, because I thought I was an obstetrician, I'm taking the CPM, the Certified Professional Midwifery Board, would be piece of cake. It was not. It was piece of cement. It was because my mind was not working. I was sick. I didn't have a sound mind because my body was not well. But when the Lord wants us to be uh, well, He says, above all things, in all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as my soul, your soul, prospered. So we cannot separate our body from our soul. When our body prospers, our soul will prosper as well. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Can you imagine God saying that to us? Because we rejoice in the truth, we can testify of the truth. We all know how profound the effect of a sickly body has on the thinking process. In these last days of Earth's history, when Gog and Magog are going on to the fray, life is not getting any easier. We cannot be fooling ourselves that times will get better. We need clear minds. We need strong bodies to, to have clear minds, to be hearing the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit guiding us into proper discernment. The beloved disciple hopes for us all prosperity in body and soul. To me, what really matters is when we are prospering in our souls. That means that we are ready for him to come anytime. Even as thy soul prospereth. What profited us if our souls don't prosper? Mm. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. This is my prayer. Yeah. Amen. 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 Father in heaven, thank you so much for the blessed home that you are preparing and preparing for each one of us to enjoy. Thank you, Father, for all that you're doing for us and especially for keeping our names in the book of life. We ask, Father, that we understand the solemnity of the times we live in and how even more important it is to be living the lifestyle of the heavenly mansions that you've been preparing for the righteous. We know that if we continue doing the things that we're not supposed to be doing, we will not enjoy the heavenly mansions. So help us, Father, as we endeavor through the help of the Holy Spirit and the ministering of the holy angels to live a life approved of you so that we will be a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable in your sight. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen.